I don't want to, to say who is and who is not a feminist. My mom was a feminist as well, and not as a feminist, as Alejandra Moreno, I don't like uh, the pink colour. It makes you think of alternative worlds. Heterosexual, homosexual, lesbian relationship. Anyone can be a feminist, so... We always have to make concessions for all rights. Where your meat is coming from? Because it's critical. Say there's no such things as boys toys or girls toys. The most unsafe place for a woman and a child is at home. We, we need to choose the battles that we can cope with. Serena, thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview. Tell me, do you consider yourself to be a feminist? Yes, I do. I've, I think I've always considered myself a feminist, although when I was probably a teenager I didn't have um, the knowledge to articulate uh, a proper um, thought or order to articulate the reasons why I I am a feminist. I, I lack the knowledge to understand um, what feminism means and why um, I, I was a feminist, but definitely. And what does it mean for you to be a feminist here in academia? Well, I think there's no much difference uh, to being a feminist in academia or outside academia. I think probably in academia we we attempt to analyse the reasons of the social inequalities, understand the reasons between this structural inequality between men and women which is socially constructed. Um, and uh, then once you understand the reasons then you try to find ways to change it. Um, in terms of academia, for, with your research what you can do is to try to understand those reasons for the social inequality and propose um, answers, um, propose alternatives to end with, with the, these structural inequalities. Mm -hmm. Let's do some fun stuff for the okay. beginning, for the warming up. Let's dispel some of the myths that people have about mm -hmm. feminists. So, feminists don't eat meat. Would you agree with that? Well, I think People decide whether they want to eat meat or not, and it's not a question of being a feminist or not. I think we probably should all reduce our meat uh, intake uh, in order to, to, to preserve and protect the environment and reduce the uh, carbon emissions. Uh, but not necessarily, is, is, not eating meat is not a question of being a feminist or, or not a feminist person. It's a personal choice, and one of the things that feminism always um, and has always um, wanted and uh, is freedom, okay, freedom to choose and therefore I think people should choose whether they want to eat meat or not, although probably we should make the effort all as a society to reduce our, our meat intake, I guess that would be <laughs> my, my answer to that. All right, thank you. What do you think about this one? Feminists don't wear pink. Uh, that's <laughs> not true either. Um, probably violet, purple is a much um, better colour for feminists, but again, no. colour, choices, um, preferences is a personal choice and everyone has the right to choose what they want to wear. Feminists hate Man, is serious? <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, I think that's absolutely wrong as well. There's an, a, an absolute fallacy. I think human beings uh, can choose their sexual orientation regardless of, of their political, ideological beliefs. So no, that's completely false. <laughs> that would lead me to the second question. Can men be feminist? Of course, of course, men can be feminist. Of course, and I think they should be feminist. In fact, maybe I should draw from Chimamanda and go to Adichie's uh, sentence and say, claim that we should all be feminist and then the world would be a better place for everyone. Yeah, that's a great one, I love it. True feminists are activists only. Well, I think uh, we should all be activists at the level we can, and, but I don't think, um, as I said, we need to understand the mechanisms of social in and structural inequality in order then to change it. So there are kind of two sides to the any feminist uh, movement, and there's the movement and there's the ideologies behind, and um, I wish I was more active in some respects uh, at some points on, on in your life, mm -hmm. but I think we are all activists uh, as much as we can. We we have to every day point out towards um, uh, yeah inequalities that we see on a daily basis. You can be an active act feminist when you educate your children if you have children, and uh, through education you can tell them 
that what they've been uh, told at school when they socialize for the mm -hmm. first time and when they are told things like you can't play with girls toys then you can say there's no such things as boys toys or girls toys and I can see that that to be a mild form of activism through education should we all be demonstrated on demonstrated on the streets yes we should at certain and we do at certain moments but you can't uh, we can't all be activists. You can't be a real feminist if you are in a heterosexual relationship. Again, I think that connects to the other question about whether um, we all, feminists all hate men. No, I don't think that's true. You can be in any kind of relationship, heterosexual, homosexual, lesbian relationship. Being a feminist or not being a feminist is not a question that would determine that. How about this one? Feminists are always angry. <laughs> That's not true either, and I would think about Bell Hooks and, and uh, her points about the power of love and how uh, feminism should um, turn to the emotions and the, the power of love to change. So no, I don't think we are always angry. You are angry about the social inequalities, you are ang angry about the violence that uh, women suffer, or we suffer, because we are women, yes, that makes you angry, but that anger does not necessarily change things and we're definitely not angry all the time. <laughs> How about this one? Families don't have hope for a better future. Well we do otherwise, I mean if you uh, believe that uh, change needs to happen it's because you hope that that change is going to be implemented and you do hope for a better future. All right, thank you very much for the warming up. Now let's continue with more specific questions. Okay. What is literally archaeology? Okay, well I think I applied the idea of literary archaeology to the contents of the near slave uh, narrative form and I draw from Toni Morrison's idea of this near slave narrative as a kind of literary archaeology which is a way of entering uh, uh, or fictionalizing a way of recording the lives of people who did not have the right the right to write their own history and in that respect literary can help us to fill in the gaps in the archive archaeological or historical or archive and what is your favorite book of Toni Morrison by the way um, I probably the last one the origin of all of others mm -hmm. a collection of, of, of essays um, yeah I would critically speaking I would point that one as, as really as a good one. one for me to write I haven't, I haven't done that yet what does it mean to invent the past could invent in the past have any negative consequences? Well, yes, I mean, when you revisit the past, it could have positive or negative consequences. Again, in the context of the neo-slave narrative, this process of reinventing the past, uh, I think, comes from a positive standpoint, which is the idea to counter all these negative uh, discourses about the slave body as a, or the slave person and slave person as a, less of a human being and in that respect it counters dehumanization uh, discourses that constructed a slave as mere chattel property so in that respect reinventing the past to giving voice to um, uh, those who didn't have the right to write their own history is a positive uh, or it's done with a positive aim in mind so i don't think it could create and it could have negative effects if that answers your question. We were talking about revisiting the past mm -hmm. and what is the exact purpose of revisiting the past? Well, in a, in a way, you know, the, the, the purpose of revisiting the past is to point out the gaps in, uh, in the historical record, uh, in the literary canon, uh, in the gaps in accounts about the past and also a way of filling in, pointing out those gaps and attempting to fill in those gaps, to hear the stories of those who were not given a position of enunciation at the time. So in that respect, um, the new slave narrative tries to revisit the period of slavery, but from the perspective of uh, a kind of a fictional narrative that tries to reconstruct a past that is no longer there. How relative is this idea to the nowadays? Are there any countries that are still dealing with these slave narratives? Mm -hmm. Is it is it a burning issue, really? Well, I think it is because I think the genre of the neo-slave narrative in the context of, of, of 
British new slave narrative and uh, actually has been pointed out by by critics and, and, and other academics who study the new slave narrative. It's important because on the one hand it shows that um, the continuing continuing legacies of the of a slave uh, of, of slavery into the 21st century in the forms of social inequality, racism, the construction of the black uh, representation of the black body. Mm. Um, also, I think it's quite important as a, as a literary genre to put the focus again on the period of slavery because, again, in the context of British um, history, much has been written about Britain as the nation which abolishes mm. slavery, sorry, the nation which abolishes slavery, and the focus has been put on the process of abolition. But um, not necessarily on uh, the process of perpetuating the trade and how throughout the 17th and 18th century slavery was an integrated within British society and yet nowadays there are um, interesting uh, research work carried out by historians such as Catherine Hall at UCL with the le uh, legacies of British slave ownership but it kind of puts the focus on uh, the perpetuation of, of this of the slave trade and slavery mm -hmm. rather than on the ending on the abolition which um, in a way is I think it's important to do that another reason why it is important because in a world that uh, in the current situation where we the world in which we live now with uh, millions of people displaced millions of people who are running away from war um, refugees, I think the neo slave narrative might help us to understand some of the characteristics of refugee narratives, migration testimonials, and in that way, kind of would be a, an interesting um, aspect to, to take into consideration. So, if there was a person who is watching us right now and if she or he would decide to read just one book that is somehow related to near slave narrative what would you suggest what would be your recommendation well i think my recommendation would be definitely andrea levy's the long song and mm. i have it here by the way ah. so uh, so uh, i think this is uh, in terms of an of a novel that would be my my choice and then in terms of short stories there are short stories with Joan Animado who mm -hmm. uh, who has written um, also Daughter and His Housekeeper but probably The Long Son is the one. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the criticism that white women from the West should not do the research of non women of colour? What was your reason to start researching your slave narrative? Well, my reason to start researching the new slave narrative was probably because of Andrea Levy. I've, I've always loved her as a writer and I kind of follow her, um, her novels and, 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 and her work and that led me into the new slave narrative as a, as a genre. And uh, in relation to your first question, whether um, we should be uh, studying, examining works that are produced by what's could be considered black British uh, women writers. Well, I think um, we kind of we need to move beyond those boundaries and those label, labels. And yet, my position as a as a white, a Spanish, a woman might not allow me to fully understand uh, some of the the issues, the topics, the inequalities, the racism that arises in in some of the novels. But I think. Um, that this shouldn't be that shouldn't be a barrier for me to try to analyze and read uh, and come up with possible understandings. How many researchers in Spain are into neo slave narratives? How many among those that you know. So how many researchers, in terms of the neo-slave narrative, well I know there are other scholars who have written about uh, Andrea Levy's novel the Long, so the Long Song in Spanish and Spanish academia, Sofia Muñoz Valdivieso from the University of Malaga. In terms of black British writing, uh, there's been 
plenty of research carried out by Carolina Fernandez here at the University of Oviedo, uh, Marta Sofia at the University of, of León, Maya at the University of Complutense in Madrid. Um, so there's, there are uh, lots of uh, scholars who've introduced or discussed black British literature in Spanish academia. Thank you. Now, how can emotions help feminists? Well, again, I think probably going back to uh, the first part about whether we should, we, we feminists are always angry. I think emotions uh, point towards that which makes us human. I'm not suggesting that animals don't have emotions, but I think it kind of helps us connect, um, show empathy, um, again, bell hooks and the power of love, um, move us towards action, emotions move us move us towards action, as Sarah Ahmed suggested. They are also culturally produced, and um, I think in a way it would help us to um, subvert discourses that uh, always associated em emotion with the feminine, and women being irrational because they are too emotional, as if that was something negative. Maybe we should look at emotions from a different perspective and uh, take them out of this um, binary or dichotomic view of emotions as something bad, rationality as something good, which is a way of building hierarchies somehow. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about you because, like we said, emotions and our personal stories, mm -hmm. they are very important when we're talking about mm -hmm. you know, doing the feminist knowledge. What is the role of literature in your life? Well, I think I need literature um, for survival somehow. You know, you need to uh, read in order to, to understand sometimes yourself, what's happening around you, to find refuge, uh, to find comfort. So literature has always been like a safer space where, where I could go when I need to. <laughs> Have you ever been told that you read too much? I don't think we read, nobody could say read too much, probably we don't read enough, that would be the answer. And I sometimes feel there's so many things I want to read and I just don't have the time. And uh, no, so I definitely don't read too much. I would say I don't read, read enough. <laughs> Can you <laughs> read several books simultaneously? Yes, well, it's something I, sh I, I, I wasn't able to do before. I don't know if now multitasking is, <laughs> is an inherent part of my, of my life at the moment. But yeah, I, I, now I'm reading uh, three books at the same time. But sometimes I, I agree that's not the best way to proceed. <laughs> and moving from that, who are your favorite, favorite feminist writers? So I think that my that this is a, a difficult question uh, to answer because you could choose many, many writers. I would say probably Virginia Woolf, uh, and then or also Simone de Beauvoir, and then Hazel V. Carvey, White Women Listen. I think that article changed um, many things for me. So I would say those three. And what are the distinctive characteristics of the contemporary feminist British literature? Because you are an expert on that. Well, I don't know if we, if we could say that there are distinctive features, because I think um, in terms of, of British literature and, uh, and contemporary British literature produced by women, there are many things that are being written and I, 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 can't, I couldn't say specific characteristics because that would be narrowing it down and um, overgeneralizing. Um, in the context of black British writing, I would say that black British women's writing is characterized by innovation, generic innovation. In the last uh, 10 years we see lots of, of writers who are playing with the genres and they're introducing thematic innovation, uh, generic innovation, I would say that's a characteristic. I don't know, Patient at Gavi rewrites uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Bernadine Evaristo, who just, she just, just won the Booker Prize, she's well known for her innovative uh, works of, of fiction since Blonde Roots, um, I, I, I think innovation. That would be my answer if I had to choose one feature. 
And then the next question, I don't know how relative that would be, but nevertheless, having analyzed numerous examples of contemporary British books written by women, by black women, could you identify the features that they have in common from the literary point of view? Again, I think there's a, um, a difficult uh, question to answer without incurring in overgeneralization and, kind, and, and reducing authors and or, or books to particular features. One of the Probably again, innovation, I would say, is, is one aspect. I think first generation writing uh, was much more concerned about questions of belonging, of identity, of asserting the right uh, to be considered part of, of British society. Also, narratives of, of, of the problematics of finding um, a place uh, they could uh, relate to. I think. Contemporary black British fiction is very innovative and I think in a way they've moved, authors have moved beyond the demands and claims of first or second generation writers. It's very often said that people who are studying literature are looking for a topic or an idea to write their own story and write their own book. Have you ever thought of becoming a writer yourself? <laughs> no, to be honest, I've, I, I haven't thought of becoming a writer. I've only written a short story once and it was after my dad died. I felt the need to put it in words, probably all those emotions that you couldn't come up or understand or find a way to negotiate. And I did write a short story and I did send it to, um, to a journal, a Spanish journal that was for, I mean, there was a call for papers for a short, short, a short, short story, and uh, they showed interest in it. But they asked me to change a little bit to make it much more um, like a thriller. They were more interested in kind of having a kind of yes, uh, like more of an action, more yeah. Fan, yeah. And I decided I didn't want to change uh, change it, so I didn't send a revi revised version of it and it's still sitting there on my um, desktop, you know, or on my computer and that's the only thing I've ever written, a short story. But I don't know, maybe I'll publish it someday, <laughs> somewhere. Um, but no, apart from that, I never felt the, that I, I could become a writer, no. I never but that was your that. emotional testimony to write that yes. story, that's why you didn't want to change that, because the yes. emotion was the centre. Yes, yeah. because uh, it was important to leave it as it was. And I think this is kind of the probably the second time I've mentioned that I've written a short story um, in my life about that topic, only probably I, I mentioned it to a colleague um, mm -hmm. at university, a good, a good colleague and friend, and and now in, in <laughs> I said it <laughs> to you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, some people would know yeah. that. All right, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you for this interview. I hope it's gonna be very interesting. There is a lot to think about, there is a lot of freedom of thought, a lot of ideas to read. I'm sure mm -hmm. the people would definitely add that to their list. Yes. Make an acquaintance. I would recommend Andrea Levy and Bernadine Evaristo as well. Re uh, read uh, Girl Woman Other and Blonde Roots if you have they are very unmelissary, remember them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Julia. Thank you.